you get stuff from things that don't work. I have a huge number of projects that come out of things that didn't work. My idea failed, but something else happened. So I try and keep alert to all of those things that are going on. Welcome to The Creator's Journey. I'm your host, Charles Gupton. Fears and obstacles on the journey of creation are things we all face. Every creator who works from the heart faces the same challenges. You are not alone. In each episode, I talk with creative leaders about the mindsets and processes they use to push through their struggles to create and put their work out into the world in order to make a difference. If creating an impact is something you're struggling to achieve at this point in your life, and you believe the encouragement and feedback of a trusted group of creative leaders could make a difference in your growth, I have a solution. I'm leading two Impact Accelerator Mastermind Groups to help a select number of creative leaders achieve objectives that are simply not possible working alone. If you're interested in building a new body of work, based on renewed creative energy and deep encouragement to grow, please let me help you do that. Contact me at charlesgupton.com. And thanks for joining me on this journey. Here's the key to my front door. Got a pillow if you lost yours. You got a seat at my table. Yeah, oh, oh. Here's somebody who believes you. My introduction to Sean Kernan and the breadth of his work was at a business conference sponsored by the American Society of Media Photographers almost a decade ago. Sean gave an inspiring talk about photography and showed images from his book, Among Trees. He then called everyone up to the front and asked for volunteers to do a movement exercise. I hesitated for a minute and then thought, well, I'm here to be uncomfortable and grow and threw myself into the mix. For the next few minutes, Sean walked the group of us through a process of interactions that transformed my thinking about creativity and connections with other people. A few years later, ASMP held another iteration of the conference, and I went almost exclusively because Sean was presenting. Sean, again, did not disappoint. When his most recent book, Looking into the Light, Creativity and the Photographer, was published, I was excited to see if it brought a similar energy and insight into the exploration of seeing. As with my previous experiences, Sean delivers the goods. He is not only a successful photographer, recognized for his work in both the commercial and exhibition art worlds, he has also worked in theater, written four books, produced and directed two documentaries, and taught at several universities as well as the esteemed Maine and Santa Fe workshops. He's an ongoing inspiration to my work and overall thinking. So welcome to The Creator's Journey, Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm a little overwhelmed by the introduction. You are a busy man. (laughs) I am. I'm sitting here trying to live up to your introduction. (laughs) Well, it's been an inspiration to me. You have compared your working method to simultaneously kicking 12 soccer balls from New York to L.A., Would you say that it's in spite of or because of doing so many things that you get so much accomplished? Boy, I that's a that's a that's an interesting question, because I I, um, am any for any good first grade teacher would tell you that this is going to be a problem that you have to think your way to a better a better way to do it. And so they would have you pack up the soccer balls and ship them. But it would be a lot less interesting experience than kicking them to L.A. I mean, can you imagine what you've encountered? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I think well, that... I think of herding cats. Now yeah, it's yeah. herding soccer balls. Exactly. And and so things that, that according to first grade teachers and uh, can be problems, can be problems for the first grade teacher. But for the kid, it's, it's kind of different. And I'm still that kid, I hope. I'm working at it. 
Anyway. I remember reading many years ago about the work of the prolific writer Isaac Asimov, and his method of working was to keep somewhere in the area of 20-plus writing projects going simultaneously. Mm. And when he hit a dead end into one, he just put it back in a folder and pull out the next one. And it wasn't a matter of inspiration. It was just a matter of what did he find that he could do on the next one. And he would just run through his folders and eventually he'd hit something or some connection or something he could write on. And he just never stopped. He just kept a lot of plate spinning, if you will. And that gave me some inspiration for my ADD <laughs> tendencies to think, you know, how do, how do I approach this? And uh, it seems to me that there's some overlap there with what you're doing, that you move to another project and keep yourself kicking something forward. Yeah, exactly. And that actually, I, I had not heard that, but it, it is close to something that another writer said, uh, and I'm blanking on his name, great short story writer. And he said, I, I write, my goal is to write 50 stories a year. Two of them are usually very good. Two of them are quite good. And the rest are not very good. But the four good ones all come out of the previous 48 or 46. Uh, in other words, you're really kind of only working on, on one piece and, and you, you work on this part of it or that part of it. But you get, you get stuff from things that don't work. I have a huge number of projects that come out of things that didn't work. That, that uh, my idea failed, but something else happened. And so I, I try and keep alert to all of those things that are going on. I well understand. It, it seems to me that everything I do comes out of a failure of something else, uh, but it's an iteration yeah. to something else, which also generally flops or fails or stumbles, but then that iteration leads to you know, something else. And uh, much like this podcast has. Or, yeah, and maybe we shouldn't say they fail. No, it's just... Maybe, a, maybe we should drop the word failing, and it's a draft, you know? And right. We learn something from it. I just think of it as an iteration now. It's, uh, yeah. you know, this one This one hits a wall or stops, and, well, kind of, where where can we lead it from here? So, yeah, um, yeah. at least that's the way I, I see it, so... No, I think you're right, and I think you can, you can go back to that little thing slumped against the wall later on, and... Uh, Pick it up again and see 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 what it learned and where it wants to go now. Right. Well, you say that you like to take other people who have had uh, a longing for a creative aspect in their lives and introduce them to an idea of working in an unanchored way, as opposed to trying to be more creative by only studying technique. Right. Take me into that a little bit, if you will. Well, it's uh, when you say introduce them, I would say reintroduce them. And I spent a lot of time looking at um, at early childhood and what goes on during that time. And you're fir that when you first start seeing things and you don't put them anywhere because you don't have anywhere to put them. But they're these kind of raw experiences. And uh, that's where that's where things begin. And then. When we go to school, we, we start to learn categorizing and structure and conceptualizing things, all of which is terribly necessary. But it's not it's it's to go there entirely is to uh, is to lose track of what is really the source. So I, I think of, of a good writer as um, as it's not about words. It's not about grammar. A good photographer. It's not about equipment. It's not about paint. Uh, it's about the feeling that you sort of let romp in the first place and don't try and nail it down too quickly. But that's, you know, especially photographers um, have gotten this notion that if they got better software or a better camera, they would be better. I think there's a, something to be said for the idea that if they put the software and the camera down for, say, six months and used a paper and pencil, that would be very, very good for their photography. It's interesting as you say that. Uh, back when 9-11 happened, um, we were in a transition. We, we were completely reliant on shooting stock photographs. Mm -hmm. And the, the stock industry, as well as the agency that represented my work, uh, both in that same time frame, everything just shut down. The agency closed. We lost 80, over 80% of our income within months. 9-11 happened and, and seemed to just, at least for a while, shut down the communication industry as I was involved with it. And we had we had just bought a, a house and a farm, 
And I put through my energy into just remodeling and working with this and thought, I'll just, while everything's dead, I'll just take some time away and ended up taking a multi year sabbatical from actively shooting. And uh, it was not intended at the time. But when I came back to it, I was more excited than I can remember being when I started. Mm. Mm. To begin with, wow! As a student, even uh, I saw things differently. I learned more about photography. Uh, we we ran a farm for a period of time, started a farmers market, and just walked away from everything communications. It seemed, and then I came back and realized I'd learned more about it huh. because of 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 taking a different lane or a different something entirely different, and have been juiced up ever since with a. a you know, the last 15 plus years have been more powerful wow. and more energetic um, as a result for me, at least, because of that, uh, of that break, I think. How long did it take you to, uh, to stop being nervous or freaking out? Or maybe you never did, but to, to let go of that sort of paralysis that, paralysis that can come up when you say, what do I do? Everything's gone. That's interesting because my my identity entirely changed in that period. Ah. Uh, I went from there were people who do who, uh, friends of ours that we developed in the uh, the farming community that did not know me as a photographer as a communicator, and when I shifted back, they looked at me with you know like a dog does when you know you have this high pitched whistle, huh. you know kind of like. You you do what? <laughs> and yeah. so I had to shift my my identity again. Uh, so it, that's a good question. Uh, it did take a while. It wasn't uh, a switch off and then on again. Um, and it's yeah. but it, the, the interesting thing there is that it helped me through the years later because from that time, the last ten years, at least for me, has been a time of a lot of identity changing. I, I make a joke that I've changed my persona or identity uh, as frequently as Madonna did outfits, um, <laughs> you know, in a performance. And uh, because I've gone through being a, a, a still photographer for commercials, a stock photographer, tried to do personal portrait work based on story and uh, the kind of commercial approach uh, started doing motion work uh, and you know, short films for business and have started a podcast in the midst of that and have been doing more writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I you know, look at what are the threads of continuity and they're not technical. They're not photography. They are, yeah. you know, based on curiosity and telling stories. Yeah. But I couldn't see that until I looked back and realized even with farming, what we were doing, we weren't growing crops and selling them we were but we were really telling a story about food Mm, and mm. the narrative about food and health and i'm like oh that's what we really that's what we really sold to people was you know a new sense of or a new story about you know growing food and working with with people on a local food production and uh, so anyway long diatribe to say I went through a lot of iterations, and I looked back and realized there were common threads uh, to them, mm-hmm. which brings me back to you as I as I look at what you do and the influence that you've had from a distance, at least on me and my thinking, is that you've done the same – it seems the same thing. You've been involved in so many areas, but there have been some common threads with you. Yeah. What do you see yeah. some of those connecting uh, points being as you look back at the dots? Well, when I when – I... I, I was trying to write something. I've had this idea for what I call a very, uh, you know, a difficult and demanding workshop, which would go on for like 15 weeks. But the image that set it off was walking into a, a wedding, which was taking place in a field, and seeing this kid writing, a kid, he was 21 or so, writing, scribbling furiously in a notebook. And the previous night, the uh, the groom's father had had a terrible accident, and everything was up in the air. Are they going to go ahead with this? What's going to happen? And I saw this guy writing, and he was a friend of mine. I knew him, and I I was reminded how, when I was his age of twenty or so, I thought I'd be a writer. But what I was really doing was not so much writing as grabbing every experience that I could and diving into everything that I could, which led me to dive into things that were really, I thought, beyond me, such as theater, 
such as photography. And, um, and I, I keep trying to reincarnate that, that person whom, you know, when, when he was doing that, nobody was, nobody was thinking, what's, gonna, what's Johnny going to do next? What's Johnny the writer or Johnny the photographer? What's he going to do next? And because uh, nobody cared. And um, so it was very liberating in a way. And that's why I, I love to work with people who've had that kind of that kind of wake up of here I am 40 or 50 or 60 years old. Curiosity and fun have gone away. I'm just trying to hold some construct together. So each each one of those iterations, uh, you know, photography kind of was shot out from under me on 9-11. Uh, and, uh, and then in 08, um, you know, the tide went out in, in terms of commercial photography. So they, in both cases, I was, I was unnerved at first and then thought, what else? What, what can I do? What was fun? And what was fun was not having clients and satisfying them, although that was a lot of fun too and very, uh, very gratifying. But what was fun was was not knowing, was walking around and not knowing, like being the, like that kid in the field or that when I thought I might be a writer, when I thought I might be a, be a, a work in theater. So the stuff that I've been doing now is, is, is diving into not knowing. I've been working on this video about the Crow Indians for about five years now. Um, I've been working on a video about the Kampala Boxing Club uh, for about five years. And, and these are like going into other worlds, other universes for me and, and not speaking the language. And boy, are you awake? You're really alert. You really see everything. And that's, that's in a way, it's the person you become from doing these things rather than the things you get done while doing them that I'm really pursuing now. It sounds like you are too. Yeah, well, it, the, a phrase comes to mind. As the carpenter is building the house, the house is building the carpenter. Ah. And that seems to align with with something you've said, that the best, best outcome of artistic work is what happens to the person making it, not the pictures or whatever yeah. art form that you know they happen to be working in. So. It's the real prize, really. I was um, – Mondrian, when he was young, was painting over some old canvases of his – and a friend of his said, what are you doing that for? Those are perfectly good pictures. He said, I'm not trying to make pictures. I'm trying to find something out. And what he found out was Mondrian, you know, what he became. <laughs> uh, who's the writer that said I, that I write to learn what I'm thinking? That's uh, Charles Wright. Charles Wright. I, yeah, somebody asked him, how do, you, uh, how do you get your ideas for poems? He said, no, no. He said, I write to find out what I have to say. And when I heard that, it was like a key That's going it. to a lock, you know? <laughs> I, yes, very much so. I got, I got this image of a little kid pulling on a tablecloth with stuff on it and pulling it and pulling it till it all falls down. And Buckminster Fuller described that as an engineering experiment. <laughs> and the kid is not trying to make a mess. He's trying to say, how, how much do I have to pull? Can I really do this? And he finds something out from that. <laughs> <laughs> to learn by doing. That's good. Mm -hmm. You talked about picking up a camera when you were young and shooting pictures that were larger than you were at the time, that the images you created were somewhere between a miracle and a mistake. Yeah. Unwrap that a bit from your years of experience working with students and, <laughs> and what you're still discovering. We all, I think, had those moments when we, we start photographing. And the first thing that happens is it's it's just a miracle that anything comes out. And then we try and get it under control a little bit. But still, uh, every once in a while, we see that, that image. I, was, I used to say in our, on our contact sheets or now in our files, where it looks like somebody stepped up. Uh, and I envision him as a man, a tall man in a black cape and hat and says, may I borrow your camera? Takes one click, hands it back and walks away. And <laughs> coming to the realization that, that you actually did take that picture, it's not a mistake. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's, it's the thing you have to get after. And it's, it's like pulling together or a bunch of skills that you don't really control very well, um, harmonize for that moment and then fall apart again the next, for the next click. But 
you then you start looking for that harmony rather than the skill and the skill is enormously important i, I don't want to downplay that but it's 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 half the equation or maybe a little less than half in terms of the great ones. Have you ever either been tempted or in the old days, I guess, on a, on a contact sheet, uh, the negative just stays there. But either in the trans, the days of shooting transparencies are now with digital, it's easy to just to hit delete or throw it off the table. Mm -hmm. um, there have been times I've thrown images like that away or almost thrown them away. Oh because yeah. I thought, well, that's not me or that, that wasn't what I was going for. And I'd push it aside. Yeah, yeah. And it was either my wife or an assistant or somebody else would look at it and go, well, this is interesting. And I go, no, not really. And they go, well, it is. I mean, what is your experience in that? Have you ever done that where you've just kind of kicked it aside because you I, couldn't see it? I have learned, I, and now it's easy to do, I have learned not to throw anything out. I had a, I had, I uh, was talking with a publisher a few years back and, and I had sent him about 40 things from a project and he said, this is, this is really interesting. Do you have any more? And I said, well, I'll go back to my, to my, uh, contacts in this case, went through and found about 40 more things that I had completely missed and that were as good as, the, as the first 40. And, and it made, made it clear that that we work at one level when we're really up on the tightrope, and then when we edit at another level, and it's a lower level. As you say, it's like you're, you're looking at that wasn't what I had in mind. This may be better than what you have in mind. So, so leaving, leaving that time factor in and going back years later, five years, two years, ten years later, and seeing that you were maybe working at a very different level than you than you were aware of at the time. So I've, I've just incorporated that now. And that was on your prison series, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, you know, a lot of images that I remember from that that you, you talked about um, coming back only later when you had to dig back into it versus what you originally thought were the strong images. Exactly. There's a, a lot of talk about developing a mindfulness practice these days, at least in, in communities or people I'm around, just you know, meditation and being yeah. quiet and such. Yeah. But it seems that just as critical, in my view, is a need for an awareness or curiosity practice. Yeah. As we grow out of adolescence, we kind of lose our awareness and curiosity about world and environment mm -hmm. uh, and and really stop seeing. What are, what are some of the ways that you encourage people to keep their curiosity alive and thriving? Well, it's interesting that you talked about mindfulness because a lot of people, me included to some extent, have thought of any kind of practice like that as quieting the mind, uh, getting rid of thoughts and so forth. Um, and I have come across other practices that say, no, you have to leave all that stuff there. You just don't, you don't think it's you, but you have to be aware of it. And that moving and doing things and trying things is, is a part of awareness. So I, I like the idea of awareness, uh, unmodulated one hopes awareness more than more than uh mindfulness although they're probably not really very different it's probably maybe a language issue but but yeah uh the the, the first question cannot be how can i beat this into shape but charles wright the guy who said uh i write to find out what i have to say gave a talk and he said you really have to learn to to keep things up in the air as long as you can he said there's a real tendency to grab the first poetic solution and pull it down and get it on the page and say, yes, I've got that. And he said, it's much more important to keep things juggling. And if you worked in, 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 you know, commercial photography and supplying the needs of clients, they give you the idea and you've got it. And they really don't want for the most part, something better or something different. So you develop this habit of, okay, I got it. And, uh, and bringing back that habit, whether it's whether it's going away for uh, for a week or blocking out, uh, I, I had a number of doctors in my classes, and they'll do things like they'll say Saturday I photograph, or Thursday afternoon I leave the office, I take pictures, and I do it every Thursday. And being that disciplined, rather than saying as soon as the time opens up, I'll do something, it never opens up, as you know. So forcing yourself out the door and into an uh, an odd space. Right. Works for me. Absolutely. Well, as you say that, I remember that uh, 
I was very much in the habit years ago when I was uh, shooting more assignment work before the stock days took over my attention. Uh, but back in the 80s, constantly thinking about shooting for the brief, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that whatever was given, the assignment or the brief that was given, shooting to that. Yeah. And I real, it took me a while to realize that I carried that into all of my work. Even when I didn't have to shoot for someone else, I was shooting for the expectations that I thought a client might want rather than shooting from the heart, Yeah. Uh, especially even in stock photographs where I had more liberty. I was still shooting for what I thought people would want to buy exactly. rather than the expression of the idea or the concept. Yeah. And it really was hard to move my brain out of that. It really uh, is. Really I mean, hard. Imagine, imagine a stock photographer, if there were such a thing these days, <laughs> shooting for something that would move a client's mind rather than fulfilling a client's mind. Because it's like, I, and I sometimes used to feel that about commercial photography in general, was that um, there was, it was like that game Teguar. Do you remember that? It stood for the game without any rules. Mm. And part of your job was to go out and figure out what on earth anybody wanted. And you would do that by shooting in every direction you could. Because the client couldn't really articulate it sometimes. And the agency couldn't really articulate it, something that the client hadn't articulated. So everybody was kind of drifty. And imagine if you could fulfill their idea or, you know, give them the idea rather than try and fulfill something that nobody had any information about. Exactly. Expand rather than just fulfill. Yeah. Uh, Well, as you're saying that, it, it, it makes me think about some of your work with medical organizations and some things that I've witnessed as well in the medical as well as sciences that younger doctors are relying more on their mobile technology to diagnose symptoms rather than more subtle observations and intuition. It seems that on a larger scale, uh, the impact of that is that we're subordinating our instincts to technology on an increasingly more frequent basis. Absolutely. What have you seen? Or, or Because, again, that seems, at least in my mind, to... Uh, uh, to connect with what you were saying earlier, that we're just when a, when a physician comes in and they diagnose, rather than listen to listen to their intuition or their gut for something deeper, it's not that different than it seems to me of listening for a, or, or observing a deeper image or connection with a human instead of just going with the first thing, get it done, and move on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly absolutely makes sense. I I did a a couple of events with uh, uh, doctors, and it was this was at the Yale Medical School. I did a presentation about about awareness more than about photography, although photography was kind of the hook. But um, the uh, several educator doctors fear exactly that that, that uh, young doctors and young trainees who have always been the smartest kids in the room are losing that intuition. And I had a a fellow who was a student of mine. He had taught at Harvard Medical School for 25 years. And he said, during that whole time, I always walked out into the waiting room and walked in with a new patient. He said, for no reason than that I I wanted to pick them up physically, see if they walked, if there's anything about the way they walked or their energy or something. And I think there's some real fear that you go to a doctor and they look at the tests and they don't look at you and then uh, they make a prescription. I had a, oh, I had a guy in my class once and he said, I'm, the crea- I'm known as the creative cardiologist. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? He said, when, when my colleagues come across something that they can't figure out, they ask me to take a look at it. And my job is to think, what else? What else could be going on that is, that is not in the first hundred things that you think of. Oh, that's great. And um, so, so the job at this hospital <laughs> is like the witch doctor. <laughs> what a great title to have. So, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this, this same guy from Harvard, when we were sitting in class, in the first class, going around, everybody's introducing themselves. And he said, you know, I'm a doctor and so on, and I feel that that we have lost our intuitions. We just do everything by the book, and we're not really taking things in anymore. The next guy said, I am a pediatric emergency room physician. I do everything by the book. (laughs) 
and and it was it was really interesting because he had a point too, and it was interesting to have both these guys who got each other completely. But in the emergency room, um, there's not much time to stroke your chin and think about things, so you do. Both true, both true things. I don't know how much that connects to validation, but I think it's, it's so important for people these days to not have uncertainty. Not you were you were talking about this a little earlier. But people are so uncomfortable with uncertainty. They're also uncomfortable not having pretty immediate validation for what they're doing. Yeah. But to be willing to sit in that unknown place and just be uncomfortable with putting stuff out there. You've you've got a story about taking your portfolio to is it Lizette Modell? Lizette Modell, yes, uh, yes. To have her re- to have her review it to give feedback how to improve your mm-hmm, work. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about that incident and the discomfort of moving out of, of, of validation uh, and, and just, you know, kind of being pushed back. Yeah. I don't want to tell the story. Talk, talk a little yeah, bit about yeah. that experience and how it impacted you and your connection with other people and students yes. these days. Yeah. Well, when, when I started out, I, I didn't study photography. I kind of picked it up in the street. And uh, although I worked very hard at it, uh, and uh, one of the first times I worked regularly at anything. Um, but after about five or six years, I was teaching at the new school, and I thought, I really, I really could use some feedback. I could use a mentor or some sort of teacher to work with. So I, I um, called up Lisette Modell, who was also teaching at the new school, and she was sort of the great teacher of her day. I don't think we have people like her now, or nobody fulfills that job. She had been Diane Arbus teacher, and a lot of other people too, a lot of other really good photographers, and she was very tough. Um, she was, she would, she would um, hold up a picture and say, this is shit, darling, don't do this again. Um, and that was information. <laughs> <laughs> you really needed to know that about something. Um, that won't, but I, I went, I, that won't work on Facebook these no, days. No, I don't exactly, think. Exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but she, um, so I, so she said, I said, could I, could I come down, maybe take private lessons with you? And she said, well, come on down, darling. She called everybody darling, whether they were darling or not. And, uh, bring some of your best work and some of your worst work and we'll talk about it. And that seemed like an odd request. But I, I rounded up all my good stuff and some bad things and went down to see her. And she said, show me your work. So I handed her the best work, of course, because I wanted her to say it's nearly perfect. Um, and she went through it and she was slowly going through it. Validation. Yeah. She was, she was slowly going through it. And um, she came to one. She said, oh, she said. And she had this Austrian accent, which I'm not even going to try. She said, oh, darling. She said, look at this. This is like Paul Strand. No, better than Paul Strand, she said. And then she said, I hate Paul Strand. And I, I knew I was going to get a lesson. So she goes through the whole thing. <laughs> and she gets to the end of it. And uh, she evens up the pictures and hands them back and said, so these are, these are, these are wonderful, darling. She, I said, well, I think they, they're okay, but I think they're lacking something. She said, life. They lack life. And she was practically yelling it at this point. And um, but she was absolutely right, because it was the time in my in everybody's journey when you're trying to get everything under control. So if if there was light here, there was dark on the other side. If something went up on the left, it came down on the right. If there were a group of trees, they lined up in a row right out to the horizon. And she said, show me your worst work. So I handed her the. um, this other little slim stack of pictures. Uh, and my idea of a failed pictures was if, so, if somebody had moved and blurred or somebody stuck their head in to the corner of the frame or a dog had run through or something that I hadn't, hadn't been part of my plan. Well, of course, that's where she found the work that was trying to get away from me, trying to get out better than, than my plans. And uh, that's sort of what I worked on for the next several years was trying to bring that child back into the picture. And um, at the very end, she, um, she uh, said, well, good luck, darling. I said, well, okay, but will you, uh, can you, will you, you know, take me as, you know, like your student or something? 
And she said, no, darling. She said, I have nothing to teach you. And she paused. And then she said, but you have so much to learn. <laughs> and, and I couldn't figure out if that was a, comp a compliment or she's just trying to get rid of me or not. But I took it, I took it as, as marching orders. And, um, and I staggered out into the daylight, a, a changed person, although it took a little while for the change to manifest. But let, let me add one thing to that. I, I went, uh, Richard Serra, do you know the sculptor? Right. Uh, Richard Serra does those huge steel pieces. Right. Um, he gave a talk recently, and, um, and I went to it, and he, he took questions, which I thought was great. And because it, there was an art school at Yale, which is where the talk was, there were a lot of art students. And he's a rock star, and so there were a lot of people listening to this and he, and one of them asked a question they said how do you how do you get past or get around your insecurity so you can start your work and he said you don't get around it that's where you start he said if you're not uncomfortable it's because you haven't started your work yet and i thought wow that's of course of course all you know we work to, to be comfortable particularly if we photograph in the in the commercial realm we're trying to get everything calm and smooth and but really the best stuff happens when you're on edge so that's that's why i look for try and provoke it in my in my work now well again back to circle back to the whole concept of validation and approval from other people we want to do work that's really safe so that it'll be accepted and you had a, a line I think it was in your book that said many portraits are rather inconsequential because they attempt too little. Yeah. That struck me as overlapping what you're just saying. We're not attempting enough and getting, again, out of that zone of comfort. Yeah, particularly in portraits. If, if we have been assigned to photograph somebody, say, by an editor or something like that, um, then there's a certain energy you want to get, certain presence. If you If you've just been commissioned by the person themselves, you want to please them, you know, you, uh, and yet if there's something kind of awkward about them, you want to pass over that. You want to, you want to sort of tuck that away. But if somebody, if you're, if you're in the room with somebody and they're so powerful that they're kind of disturbing, why would you get rid of that? You know, that's the very reason you're there. And that's the very reason they're there. Um, I, some years ago, I photographed a poet. I saw him at a, at an opening. I sort of like to photograph him and he said, okay, um, and he looked like he was a really terrific poet. He looked like a poet who'd been trapped in the body of a late middle-aged traveling salesman of office equipment, which is what he was. Um, and uh, so he turned up at my apartment, and I was after the power. But he walks in, he says, I see myself 28 with a wind in my hair. Well, he had no hair. <laughs> there was no wind, and he was a long way from from twenty eight. So uh, I I took the pictures, and I kind of I really liked them, and I kind of chickened out and mailed them to him. And he wrote back, and he said the pictures are wonderful, though I hate them. And it was it was such a lesson, but it's a lesson I have to learn over and over and over again. That I mean, one always wants to look better. One always wants to look better, and, and, and me too. And so when you sort of head toward that, um, you fail. And I'm, I'm sure you've, most people have seen the famous picture of Winston Churchill. Was it Yusuf Karsh? Right. The portrait of Churchill sort of glowering at the camera. There, if you go online, you, you, the story is that Churchill was smoking a cigar, and Karsh went up and yanked it out of his mouth, and took the, the picture. And before that, Churchill had been trying to look friendly and nice and, and so forth. And if you go online, you can see the other pictures from that. And they're totally boring. There's just him trying to look friendly and, and uh, pleasant and normal. And it was this disruptive thing that made this timeless photograph happen. So do they like it? I mean, I go through this, too. I want people to like it. I want people to like what I do. But uh, so did Vincent Van Gogh. Nobody, nobody liked what he did. So did Herman Melville. Nobody liked Moby Dick. It was massive failure. 
So, which doesn't mean that every time you fail, you've done something wonderful, but at least that has to be on the table. And it, it can be on the table if you, if you really have that in mind and try for it, try to let yourself get carried away. And uh, if it's disruptive, it's disruptive. And it can't be disruptive if it's the same thing that you've been peddling and peddling and peddling. Yeah, you know, I, I had a computer scientist in my class, and he was very uncomfortable with some of the assignments, although he really was very avid about doing them. And I came to this realization that if you're a scientist and you do an experiment, the next thing you do is repeat it and see if it comes out the same. And then the next thing you do is you give it out to colleagues and they repeat it and you hope that it comes out the same. So that's the sign of a successful, uh, a successful experiment. But for an artist, if you do it and then repeat it and then repeat it again, immediately people will be saying, you're just repeating yourself. You're not doing anything. This need to fit in is an important thing. When kids get to be about seven, their drawings change from these fantastic imaginary things to these very awkward things. And the awkwardness comes from the fact that they're trying to draw what they think it should look like. And they don't know what it should look like, uh, you know, drawing a hand or drawing a house. And, so, and, and I used to think that, oh, was, education was just crushing their little minds. But really, at that age, you sort of want to figure, how does this work? How does life work? Where do I fit into this? And it's totally legitimate. But, it's, uh, but it also can just become the only concern that we have. As I was preparing for our conversation, I read a sentence or a quote from you that said, not falling over is not the same as continuing on. <laughs> if you've built your self-image as a photographer, what if picture taking no longer appeals to you? Yeah. Do you keep taking them anyway? And I think for a lot of people that they found some modicum of, su of success, they and, and it's just that inertia. They keep doing it yeah. long after the life is there. It fits in. And even if they're 57, they're acting like the seven-year-old that's, it seems to me, that's still trying to figure out what fits in and how do I get well, it's, it's, back to validation? How do I get approval validation? What, one needs to recapture at that point. What, what goes missing is the, uh, the invention and the imagination. And the first pictures we take all seem invented and imaginative. Um, but the same thing will, will, will happen to a lawyer. Let's say a, a young lawyer um, puts together a case and he takes factors from this and that and the other part of the law and has a successful conclusion. Um, then you start chasing successful conclusions. But what, what was probably the most interesting thing about it was the pulling together of, of odd things and things that didn't go together and finding that they did. So it's, it's the invention that led to the success. And you think, well, it was a successful photograph, so I'll just keep photographing. No, it was the successful awareness and seeing. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what I'll do in a workshop is uh, is on the first assignment, I have people write something and I tell them, do not write this well, just write it down, just get it down. But they come back and usually the writing is very, very good. And the seeing is very, very good. And then I say, if you had photographed this same thing, would it be as good? And they all kind of sheepishly shake their heads and say, no, um, I'm, I'm excited because I've been asked to teach a writing workshop out of the Santa Fe, uh, Santa Fe workshops next spring, which is kind of a leap for me, and I'm appropriately nervous about the whole thing. But um, what I want to do, I've often wanted to do, is let's put the camera down, not for a day, but for all week, and let's see, let's see, let's not try to write things, let's try to see things and write them down. Wow. Yeah, that, uh, I can see where that could be quite an uncomfortable exercise, the way that many people yeah. feel about writing They've been either criticized by English teachers or somewhere along the, the line and are so self-conscious about putting committing words to paper, um, but one that will pull them out uh, again to be able to well, see the, again. The, the question that, that I will introduce in that class, as I do in every photography class, when we people put up their work from the first assignments, and, and I say, to drop the question of, is it a good photograph? Ask, is it alive? And if it's alive, good will take care of itself. And whether it fits within the norms, if it's alive, it will overcome everything. So that's, that's 
that's going to be, I'm going to go at it the same way. Well, that, that reminds me of a, uh, of a line that Liz Gilbert talks about uh, in her book, Big Magic. And I also heard an interview with her, a couple of interviews recently, where she talks about the difference between being original and being authentic. Mm-hmm. That authenticity resonates mm-hmm. with people, whereas being different in an mm-hmm. uninteresting mm-hmm. way covers the originality yes. originality element, but it still doesn't engage people on a visceral level. Yeah. Uh, so she pushes people to be authentic rather than original. Exactly. Very good. Good line. Very good. Yeah. Good thought. Well, my introduction to you came, as I, as I mentioned earlier, was through the motion exercise that you directed. So I want to slip over there a little bit because I feel like we're running parallel mm-hmm. to that. Uh, one of the games that you, that you literally walk people through is one of, of them walking with an imaginary bowl of water across a room and then back again with a slight hitch mm-hmm. as an exercise in self-awareness and authenticity. Unwrap that exercise a, a, a bit and what comes out of it. Well, that's like, like so much of what I do, that's a steal from um, Peter Brook, who was this incredibly – groundbreaking director and the member of the Royal Shakespeare Company um, who really changed the way people direct and act, uh, one of the great pioneers. Uh, and he had this little exercise, and there's, I saw a video about it, and I thought, that's fantastic, because I, I, can, I can tell you about the difference between an authentic movement and a conceptual movement, and we will all nod and say, yes, yes, I know. Uh, but when you see it wordlessly, somehow it can go in much more strongly. So this, this, um, this exercise, the first thing I do is I mime handing somebody a bowl of water, very, very full, heavy. And I say, I just want you to walk this across the room and take all the time that you want. Um, imagine the weight, feel the weight in your hands and There's no time we have to get this done by. Just walk it carefully across the room without spilling a drop. And people can really focus on that, and they really get into it, and it's kind of fun to pretend that. Um, And they just disappear into that act, even though there's no bowl. And when they cross the room, I say, that's wonderful now. I want you to come back. But halfway across the room, approximately, I would like you to trip and fall and spill the bowl. So they start back again in this very deep space, but then you can see them shifting into, into the question, how do, what would this look like and what do I have to do to make it look like that? And immediately it goes into the mind instead of into the, the body and the hand. So everybody comes up, it, it just looks fake. It always looks fake. Even people who do it fairly well, 90% of the people do what I did the first time, which was pretend to let my back foot catch on my front foot and tumble forward. Or sometimes people just sort of say, I don't know what to do, and they just kind of sink to the floor or something like that. But it's, um, it's, it, it makes it so clear the difference, the visible difference between some movement that is authentic, even though it is based on nothing in a way, because you're miming the whole thing. There's no bowl, there's no water, but it's the, it's, your mind goes into that and stays there. And then when you come out to try and make something happen, it doesn't, it doesn't look good. Um, there, there's a, there are other series of other things like that where, where you, you can, um, let me see if I can, let me see if I can remember this correctly. One of the first times I encountered this, was a wonderful book called Zen and the Art of Archery, which is quite famous, published in the 50s by a Swiss philosopher who went to teach in Tokyo. And he wanted to study Zen. And one of a colleague said, "Uh, how about archery? We do Zen archery here. And so he said, "Okay, fine. And he goes with his friend to the teacher and the teacher gets him finally to draw the bow, which is not just a matter of drawing the bow. It has to be done mindlessly. And then he says, shoot the arrow, and he points at the target, and he lets go, and he misses it completely and keeps missing. And finally, the teacher says, you're still shooting at the target. The string has to act as though it's cutting through your thumb, and you're just letting go. And suddenly he does it, and he's bang, 
into the target. It's hard to explain these things. It doesn't it doesn't fit into uh, into uh, you know left brain uh, studies of things. And yet, once you do it, then you have it forever. Once you see it at work, you really have the idea. Well, there's also the in my mind the uh, the performance aspect of what we think other people will think of us as we are are doing these kinds of exercises. And I remember the the exercise that I participated yes. in that yeah. that you seem to do a fair amount is have people t- uh, to music uh, move across the room and pass a ball or a, a ball of paper to other people, and then they move to and the music changes and they move. Yeah. And I was watching mm-hmm. a, a contrast of of two of the, the videos that you had of a group of people doing it that were not professionals. They were you know, non-professional dancers. And then another group that was mixed with professional dancers and, and other folks. Yeah. And thinking about how, at least in my mind, I think about how people dance when they might be in the kitchen or at home doing something and no one's watching the old phrase dance like no one's watching. Yeah. But that self-conscious fear of moving right. and being embarrassing or, or silly, but the professional dancers that were doing it in that exercise were I mean, they were extravagant in their gestures and and yet instead of being silly in mm-hmm. their extravagance. They were beautiful, and the ones that were awkward were the ones who were mm-hmm. self-conscious. So it takes me back to the water exercise that letting go of that awareness yeah. was more authentic rather than how would this look to other people if I did it right? Yes, yes. That's – yes. And and the, 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 the other thing is having that simple task of just take this ball and walk it across the room and move with the music – the task takes you out of your self-consciousness. Right. And people just start, they just do it. And the interesting thing about working with the, this is a dance company that I, that I work with a lot, and I always wanted to see what they would do with it. And, and they knew exactly what to do, and they knew how to be very inventive um, as dancers. But the most, the most interesting and disruptive part of that exercise was when one person, my wife, who's not a dancer, walks across with and puts the paper in her mouth and walks up to another guy who is also not a dancer and leans her head back and he l- leans down and takes the paper out of her mouth with his, with his mouth. And suddenly, oh my God, it's so inventive and so funny and not beautiful at all, but very alive. I, I think it's maybe one of the most alive moments in that. And, and the dancers were wonderful, and, the, and their play was wonderful. But this is the one that really kind of disrupted. You know, something happens in an exercise, whether you're participating or watching, where suddenly something clicks, and you say, oh, yes, I understand. It's bigger than what it seemed. And something bigger is going on than I thought. And that was the moment for me. Yeah, absolutely. As I said at the outset, that it transformed my my thinking about connection with people. And now when I'm giving presentations, I try to incorporate some kind of movement into it. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Linda, and I took several improv classes, oh, great. not for comedy, but just uh, you know, uh, several years ago to get ourselves out of that mindset of – of, of appearances, if you will, yeah. uh, so that when we're doing presentations, we could be more, uh, be in a sense, be more engaging with people. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the, as you were talking about the water exercise, one of the things that, a simple thing that came to, to mind when we, we think about miming or doing improv around talking on a telephone, people will do this kind of a Y gesture with their little finger and their thumb holding a phone up to their head. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then you think, well, that's not how we hold a phone up to our head. We hold uh-huh. a phone up by just holding it up. But holding it up. we wouldn't do that in that context. But then once you do it, you realize somebody is in that moment. Mm-hmm. They're really talking on a phone. They're not mimicking or miming. Yeah. And so improv helped me see the difference between being authentic and the need to be exaggerate authenticity, if you will, yeah. rather than exaggerate inauthenticity. Yeah. Exaggeration's okay as long mm-hmm. as, as we're exaggerating 
what's authentic because it becomes believable at that point. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Improv is great for that because you, you, if you, I, I've done it. I did a, a wonderful workshop with Alan Arkin once, and oh. there was a there was a guy in it, and he and I were working together. He was a, he was actually a doctor, and this this may get back to the whole doctor thing, but he came in with an idea and wouldn't give it up. So the whole thing just kind of died and I assaulted him literally. <laughs> but, but you know, that's the, the whole thing about all of these sort of on your feet games is you come, if you come with in with an idea and you, your, your job has to be to figure out what the dance is, what is everybody dancing and start doing it. Um, and if you come in with the insistence that it's going to be your dance, people ignore you. They don't believe you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Which is certainly true of photography. Same, the same principle in photography or pop music versus real music or, or you know, some painting that moves you or performance that moves you has that thing. If, if the first thought is, how can I charm these people? How can I charm my audience? You're dead. Well, the control, the need for control kills the life. And it's whether it's a photograph or writing or yeah. music. Uh, I mean, I think of, of the, the years improv has been probably one of the most important things for me as a photographer doing mm. commercial work because right. invariably I would walk in with an image in my mind and either the power would be out or um, <laughs> you know the light or something would be different or I'd have I'd have three minutes with the executive instead of the 30 minutes that was planned yeah and I couldn't light it or I couldn't do something and you better learn to say yes and mm -hmm. and respond mm -hmm. or you got nothing. Yeah, you go home with an empty, uh, with an empty camera, if you will. Yeah, or throw a fit, <laughs> which doesn't work. Actually. Yeah, see how far that takes you. <laughs> let's let's dip a little bit into your self nourishing practices. It seems that a lot of your projects come about as a means of feeding your soul for growth. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, what keeps you balanced and creatively refreshed? It's interesting because it's in a way it's always changing. When you talk about balance. I have achieved a certain reputation for being balanced, but really I achieve balance only when I'm sliding from one side to the other. I spend about two seconds in balance and then I <laughs> overbalance another way. So it's, it's kind of learning to use the dynamic and to expect the dynamic and not trying to, not trying to, um, you know, like as a meditator, trying to shut your mind from thinking anything at all. And it's going to be a long time and it's never going to work. Um, so I do a lot, a lot of what I do certainly moves, moving into video from photography has introduced time in an interesting way. Uh, writing, I probably, if, I, if somebody, if, if the MacArthur Foundation were to turn up and say, you know, we've been watching you and we think you really need a chance to explore some things, I would write. I would stop photographing. And I may yet. But I, but I too have this, you know, photography's worked very well for me and sort of, I'm the photographer. So, uh, it's not so easy to just say, well, I'll just stop doing that. Um, do you know, do you know the work of Wright Morris? I do not. Photographer and author. I do not. Well, he's an incredible photographer and he's incredible author. He had a very successful, uh, writing career. He published, you know, five or six novels. And at some point in maybe the, 50s he said i just want to photograph so he stopped writing altogether and he he photographed a lot in small towns in nebraska which is where he'd grown up and uh in a way he's like a more passionate um walker evans um he's he, he's he's kind of more deliberate than walker evans he's really trying to create a uh, a, a feeling of timelessness and people and a slight, slight ghostly quality as though somebody had just left the room that he photographed and they're not coming back. And he did that for, he did four or five books of photography and then he stopped and he went back to writing again. And I was just so impressed by the, 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 how hard he charged at both of those things. Cause it's very hard to get going as a writer and to set it aside is a big deal. Right. Uh, and then it's hard to get going as a photographer. And to set that aside again is a big deal. 
so I, I, I guess I'm looking to be scared a little bit, uh, and that's that's why I heading more toward writing fiction. That's good, to lean into the fear and the uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. But also the tremendous power that you have as a writer here. It's a sunny, beautiful day here in Connecticut. Uh, and But if I were to sit down and write the, the scudding clouds over the sea brought threats of doom to him as he stood on the shore, it would be as true as anything could be, you know. Well, that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> That's pretty wonderful. And then you're responsible to it, you know? That's right. What is something that you believe in the core of your being to be true that many other people would quite probably not agree with you on? The key or a key uh, to completing anything well, I won't even say successfully, well, is in allowing it, is, is in learning when to get it under control and then when to allow it when to stop trying to control it. And I don't mean just photography. I, I, I mean everything. You know, this, this, I feel like I'm working on this Sean Kernan project that I've been working on for X number of years now. And, um, and it's worked well enough that it's very, it's very daunting to let it go, to, to sort of go out on the road and, and see what else is going on, um, to see, who, see what else you are. I, I have an idea for a, a novel that I call Half Begun. It's not even Half Begun. Uh, it's called Old Age, Sickness, and Death, a comedy. <laughs> and it is a comedy. And it's, it's, about, it's about a man who's, who's, who is pursued by a mafia assassin whom he hired 30 years before to kill him if he ever got old and infirm. And, and he's old and infirm, but he's fine. You know, so suddenly here and but the the assassin has, is totally demented. So so it's there. Cha- it's it chases him out of his world and out into some other world. And I've I've spent a fair amount of time working on it. Um, but it's it's uh, it's tricky because it's such a it's such a clever idea. That it the, the cleverness keeps wanting to take over and I can't you know, it has to be it has to be authentic. Or else it just sounds like situation comedy, you know? Clever for the sake of clever. Yeah, yeah. A one-liner, essentially. So you, you see it in movies, you know? I think the thing that I most fully believe, but I haven't tested it yet, is that you have to get out of your own way and allow things. Well, it sounds like you're testing it as you go. I am. I, I, I may, life has a way of insisting on the test and they, marching up to you and saying, the test begins now. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I've got to sharpen my pencil first. Yeah. No, now. That's right. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm in the middle of a test, and I go, but I didn't bring pencils. Wait a minute. You know, I thought, I, I thought it would be a wonderful little one-act play of a guy in his apartment, and there's this knock at the door, and there's this man in black who says, it's time to go. And the man says, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And gradually, as they talk, in, in, this is death has come for him. And he's saying, and he's saying, well, listen, I let me. I just got to make a phone call first. No, it's time to go now. I have to feed the cat because nobody's coming until next week, and the cat will die. No, we have to leave now. I'm, I'm trying to have a reasonable conversation with death and put it off. That's a good short film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there someone you know who's outside the spotlight, but they're doing something important, having an impact that the world should know about? Yeah, yeah. There's a guy, a guy who was in my very first photography class, which was in some ways still the best one I ever, I ever had because it was all so new. Uh, he was a very, very gifted photographer, a very sensitive guy. Um, I think he was, he was dyslexic. So he'd spent a lot of his time in school being, feeling like the, the outsider and that kind of thing. But in fact, he was usually the, the most smartest and sensitive person in the class. Anyway, he, he went through life, he, um, he, he was a carpenter and then he became a builder and then he ran a very successful construction company. Um, but he always would take a, a, an old Polaroid camera around on the job. When he, whenever he saw a cemetery, he'd go in and take pictures of the cemetery art. And then he went off to Genoa, I think it was, because he, he heard that the cemetery art there was wonderful. And he brought out a book 
about five years ago called The Burden of Wings. And then he, he went back to, uh, he went to small towns in Italy. And this was 20 years ago and did extraordinary set of photographs of these small towns. And they really, people don't look like that anymore. Um, and he's bringing that out as a book. And, and these just suddenly started, he said, I have to get back to this. And now he's starting to do uh, new work, which is quite extraordinary. And, I, and again, I think it's the, the courage that it takes to do that, to say, okay, I've, I've built all the, uh, all the buildings I want to build and dealt with all the uh, city inspectors that I want to deal with, but now I, w- I want to fulfill that promise. I think that's just amazing. Uh, his name is Mauro Marinelli, and he's just, uh, the work is just quite beautiful, but, but what's even better is, the, is going back to it, bringing it out again, doing it, and doing new work. Well, that's great. And I'll put a link to his website and books on the show notes Great. so that people can find that easily. And I can send you a link to the, uh, to the two, to those movement exercises too. If you want to, if people wanted to see those, that'll be great. We'll put those there as well. I want people to be able to be able to experience you and what you do as much as they can. So we'll definitely do that. Great idea. Great. What is one thought that you'd like to leave with the listeners that you believe could make a difference in their lives? Oh, I'm so tempted to be a smart ass. Brush your teeth after meals and (laughs) see your dentist twice a year. Shut up and listen. (laughs) You know, somebody was interviewing me once and and what I came up with was you don't want to take something that looks like a photograph. You want to take something that doesn't look like a photograph. (laughs) And it's still a photograph. I'm still trying to do that, too. Very good. Well, if folks want to connect with you uh, over the interwebs, what are the best places to to connect? Uh, SeanKernan.com is a good one. And uh, I'm also on Facebook. A lot of people my age diss Facebook, but I've had the most fun finding old classmates and weird things like that. The only rule that I make is I never repost anybody else's comments. It has to be original. <laughs> but uh, I'm out there. And, you know, Santa Fe workshops or main workshops are in touch with me, too. Good stuff. Thank you for the work that you continue to keep doing. <laughs> it's good stuff. You've been a great inspiration to me in terms of movement and vision. Thank you. It, I, ha- I have no choice, but I, uh, I do appreciate uh, talking to you, too. It, it provokes me to think about things again something i i never want to stop doing there we go thank you so much thanks for listening to the creator's journey if you enjoyed our theme music the name of the song is you've got a home by krista wells the creator's journey has published the first and third sundays of each month except for july and december if you enjoyed the show I would appreciate having you go to iTunes and subscribe. While you're there, if you give us a favorable rating and review, it'll make a huge difference in helping a newcomer easily find it. You can find links to today's guests, the people and books we talked about, and email me with your wonderful thoughts, all at thecreatorsjourney.com. I want to thank Yodelus for sponsoring this episode of The Creator's Journey. Yodelus is an interactive marketing platform for people in the creative world. With a vetted database of contacts from across the industry, Yodelus helps photographers, illustrators, creative directors, designers, producers, stylists, and many others to locate potential clients and gives them the tools to make those connections happen. If you want to find out how Yodelus helps creative people find one another for work, just go to yodelist.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash TCJ. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player.